Sorry we're running late, but we're here, we're on your live, so those who are supporting us, we appreciate you. We ask you just come on, tell a friend, tell um, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever you your auntie, whoever it is, I want to tell them to get on, because we want to uh, share with you about the goodness of God, amen, on today. So, we are praising the park, I don't hear no noise, not get some noise. Amen, amen, amen. So again, you guys are all welcome, just want to share a little bit with you before we get started about this season, this time, what's been going on. We all know we've been in the house, locked down. Now we have a little freedom now we can get out. We've been coming up with creative ways to do things through Zoom, Google, all kinds of ways we've been trying to get that technology thing. So here's a little, some little things I'm gonna put out there about uh, what we've been doing. If you guys are recognized and understand and know, just make some noise on the screen that you be right there, you with me. Amen. Uh, let's see. So one of the things we've been doing is this TikTok thing. I don't know if y'all been doing TikTok, whatever the kids you say, we've been doing it. say TikTok, the old people say the TikTok. But the TikTok we've been doing in the house, <laughs> and here's one beat that we've been doing. If you ain't been doing it, I'm sure you've been doing it. Act like you, you, know you know you've been doing the TikTok, amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
people don't always um, understand millennials. Here's the thing about Jesus, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, yes. Amen. Hallelujah. But everything in, world, in the world changes and evolves. Yes. And what does not die. Yes. So, <clears throat> my generation may not want to sing the blood like that, but as long as they get the understanding that the blood will never lose its power. Yes. Then yes. we were covering our bases and doing what needs to be done. Yes. So, the uh, last song I'm going to do is... Kind of a remix to another song because that's what I do. Okay. I flip songs. I, I usually rap and sing. And I would go in church and they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> so they didn't. So I wanted, because usually I move around and stuff. I wiggle and I dance and everything. My mom was like, You do that? She was like, You lucky that I'll throw you out. I was like, You're right. <laughs> but in order to get people to accept me, I had to learn how to play their game. And so doing songs like It Won't Lose. And flipping it was my way of getting people to understand I love him like you do. Yeah. So um, I just like good music. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, I'm ready now. Yeah.
So, recently, about three weeks ago, I got a job offer. And yeah, I was a little tempted for money. So I took the offer. I took it. And then I said, well, you know what, Lord? I didn't ask you if I was supposed to take that job. Because the last job where I was making over six figures last year, the Lord called me out of that job. And see, that's when I learned that you can't chase money. You can't run for money. You got to do what you're ordained to do, even when it's work. I don't care if you're an assistant. I don't care if you're a janitor. You work that thing like that's the last thing you got. You're going to work like you're working for the Lord. So I learned last year, you don't chase money. You work where God assigns you to. So the Lord assigned me somewhere. And so I said, you know what? You pulled me out so we can become full-time entrepreneurs. Yes, they're promising money, but I know my God promised money too. So with the two days I'm sitting there debating what I should do, and um, I said, you know what? I'm gonna have to decline this offer. I said, I don't wanna decline this, but I'm gonna decline this offer. I declined it. The next day I go to the ATM. My bank account, before I went to the ATM, my bank account said $50. I go to the ATM, my bank account said $2,600. I checked the account. It's an unemployment. I said, what? They kept telling me I wasn't going to get it. But when you know, when you worship God, God made things on your behalf. And I just stopped there. So he showed me right then and there. See, you put your trust in me. And you knew that the, the job is not going to sustain you. I'm going to sustain you. I bring the money to you. Not me. Me. And it came the next day after I declined the offer. And then the next day after that, they called me back and said, Shay, we got something better for you that's going to pay more. And you don't have to work as hard. I said, Lord, I said, take it. Take it. Because I'm going to sign you there for three months. I'm going to show you a mighty move for three months. When you ain't got to work the whole year, just watch and see what I'm going to do for you. I said, okay, Lord, sign money. I took it. Right? But it still wasn't 100% promise. I still had to wait for two weeks just to make sure I really had it. Because then they called me back and said, oh, we might have somebody else. I said, what? I said, all right, God didn't tell me that, but okay, cool. <laughs> and I was right, because God didn't tell me that. They called me back and said, you got it. I said, I know what God he said I had it. Thank you. I ain't telling you that, but in my head I said that. Um, so that was that. I'm still moving, moving. Then a week later, I go back to the ATM. We was going to the beach. I pulled something out. I said, oh, it's a lie. Let me throw this away. I don't know what I just saw. I go, and then Monday come, the Lord was like, check your bank account. I said, what? All right, I checked the bank account. This guy's. So the first time I checked, it was 2600 right? Second time, guess. Double. 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 Okay. This time, it was $4,600. Amen. Now, I'm not saying the numbers to brag or boast. I'm saying the numbers so you can understand what God can do for you. So if you came here today with your pockets empty, if you came here today wondering how you're going to provide for your family, look at me. And remember my story. I told you I had $50 in the account. And he showed up. And when it came, I said, Lord, my husband and I, we've been praying and we've been asking, can we have a vehicle? It's getting to a point now where we can't operate on one car. We need another vehicle and I'm going to buy it out. Please, Lord. God said, go get it. I said, what? <laughs> if I take this money and go get it, then what are we going to do about the rest? Right. right? <laughs> but then I had a sister over here that came and prophesied to me. She said, more is coming. I said, thank you. Come on, I said, babe, we're going to go get a car. He said, what? I said, you heard me. You heard me. We're going to go get a car. <laughs> because the opportunities is coming. We got to get there. And we went. And it was one heck of a process. It was one process, man. It was a process. But I said, my God is faithful. He's going to move. And he did. And we walked out of there. Here you go, Lord. After we paid our tithes, of course, gave 10% to the church. We walked out of there. And I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. So the job came. I start tomorrow. The money came. And we got a call. Trust in God. Amen. Don't doubt him. If you
tell you to let something go, it's because he got something else for you. He got something better for you. He has more for you. Because our God moves and he gives exceedingly and abundantly more than we ask or think. He ain't going to give you pennies. He's going to give you more. He's going to pull out a blessing from heaven. And that's the God that we worship. That's the God that we worship. So leave here with faith. And remember these testimonies. Remember them. He is going to get you through. Amen. Amen. Next up, we have Daniel Combs. Let me get a clap. Let me get a praise for Daniel Combs. Let's go, brother. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Donna's called me uh, last week to come uh, sing as they bring me the car. I was like five states away. <laughs> so I, I, get, I get home uh, yesterday and find out I got two broken strings in my guitar. So. Wow. I'm just going to sing something without music, but that's cool. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Lord, I saw your face last night When I looked in the sky You were smiling It told me it wouldn't be okay You would make a my dark time and every time I hear your voice and every time I feel your touch let me know that I can face tomorrow one more time when all my friends Go away, I'll be glad you stay. You'll still need me, and even when the wind blows by, I'll feel warm inside. You're so lovely. Situation, but uh, for a long time, I was kind of like 
I went without a car. You know what I mean? Like I've had cars, had nice cars, you know what I mean? Not so nice cars or whatever. But I took took one on the chin and allowed myself to go without, took public transportation, things like that, just so we can, you know, accrue more money, save, things like that. And um, not too many people are really keen or really want to sacrifice. And that really played a, 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 a pivotal role in where we are today. Um, so there was, <laughs> there was moments where you know, she would get frustrated. Hey, you need to get a car, you need to get a car. And then there'd be moments where I'm like, hey, I didn't hear anything from God. So. And that's one thing that I like about our relationship is how we, we, uh, we keep an open ear open for, you know, for God. And pay attention to what she says. Because a lot of times, you know, not speaking for all men, but I know for myself, I could be very prideful and I want to listen to what she has to say. And then all of a sudden, it gets me in a situation. And then I got to deal with it. Hear her voice again, which is uncomfortable, but it's all good because she means well and she has my back and she's a great supporter. Um, she definitely a help me, um, which is very important. So, uh, so going back to the to the car, uh, she uh, I think it was like December or something like that. She heard guys say Dodge, and I'm like, what the heck? I don't even like Dodge. I'm more of like you know on a on a, on a different scale when it comes to vehicles. So I kind of downplayed it, and uh, I, I let it ride, and I started doing my research, and I said, you know what, there are some vehicles that I really enjoy out of Dodge, and um, out of nowhere, I just started seeing, like, challenges and stuff like that, so I was like, what? what? I, can't, I can't afford that, Lord, not right now. You know, but um, to make a long story short, I kept seeing them, and I, kept, I prayed on them, you know what I mean? So it's like... For instance, just to make an example, like certain things in life, you know, we really want. We want to go after it. We want that thing. We want a million dollars, or we want this new house, or we want this car, or whatever it is. Start praying on it, manifest it, see it. Yeah. And that's one of the situations that kind of happened with the vehicle is that I manifested the situation that I wanted, and now I have it. Amen. So it's like, even with my wife, I kind of denounced not having a wife. I didn't even want to get married, but God changed my mind on that. And he manifested that thing, and now I'm married to that. Amen. So, um, so I'm gonna end that right now uh, to bring up our praise dancer. And today we have Tempest. Woo! She's going to her thing. So let her step back and let her. It's your breath in our arms, so 
bones will sing. Serve him. Yes. 
Amen. So, <laughs> that's what I that's what's said before you today. So, what has it been? Four years, three years, babe? Three years? Four years since we started House of the Big Church? And, uh, amen. So, it's been four years since we started House of the Faith Church, and we've been doing things some unorthodox ways. That mean that church isn't used to. And we had to get comfortable with 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 not everybody's approval. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Because not everybody understood what we were doing. But that's what we encourage somebody to do. As long as you're in the will of God, All right. Right. what God has for you, yes, then you're in the safest place in the world. Ain't that a song? Yes, that's a song, God. Yeah. Safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. Yeah. And then, so you want to do and you want to be where God is calling you to be. Amen. And you want to do it the way that God is calling you to do it. Don't be influenced by anybody else. Amen. That's even the word outside of the church. Don't be influenced by the world. Amen. Because the world is on its way to hell. The ways of the world are on its way to hell. Amen. So again, I want to just thank you all for coming here. Amen. I got my barber here today. Amen. We got him fresh yesterday. <laughs> So I just thank everybody for being here. It really means always want to communicate. Always tell my wife this. We want to communicate to people just how much they mean to us. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times we let it slip. And we want to let people know how thankful we are for what they do. Because the fact of the matter is, and I always say this, nobody has to do anything for you at all. You can feel entitled if you want. <laughs> but ain't nobody got to do nothing. You. They don't have to come to your events. They don't really have to support you. We want support. And it's wonderful when people do, but they don't have to. So when people do support you and they, they you know the God the way they show their love for you, I want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. So I thank all of you, my cousins, my nieces, my nephews are in here. I wish they were. <laughs> but they are in here. Uh, my sister, my mom, my dad, everybody, my aunt. Um, you, you, and you. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Amen. And today for us is a day to give thanks. Amen. As, as Tina said, we've all been in the house. Amen. And as Lisa said, um, I missed, I didn't miss church. We don't do church anyway. So, but I, because the church is who we are. Right? We are the church. We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. Right? So we don't do church anyway, but I didn't miss the fellowship of being around people. So we began to just think of, thinking about ways that we could kind of come together in the midst of everything that's going on. And the Lord inspired me with this, amen? amen. To come out in the park. We got masks if anybody want them. We got hand sanitizer if you want to use it. But as my cousin said, she was tired of a mask. You're probably tired of hand sanitizer too. Your hands probably dry and more <laughs> alcohol. But this is what the Lord inspired me with, for us to come out here and fellowship, fellowship together in the park, amen? And it's just a day for me to say thank you to those who support us, those who are the members of Household of Faith Church, and then those who, uh, excuse me, I say the members of Household of Faith Church. See? <laughs> I just want to say thank you, you to everybody who supports Household of Faith Church. Amen. Verse 26. And it's our way to say thank you to God. Amen. It's a way to say thank you to God. So, in our church, in Household of Faith Church, on our Sunday messages, we've been in a series that is called the Believer's Privilege. Amen. And 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 the reason it's called Believer's Privilege, I don't know if anybody heard it, but on the news you hear heard about white privilege, right? And you heard about black privilege. If you're not familiar with what black privilege is, it's when black people of color. Uh, they accumulate wealth, and they move out of the hood, and they disassociate themselves from everything that they're used to as being a part of the hood. That is called black privilege, right? And you know what white privilege is? That's being uh, what they call white supremacy and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the Lord inspired me. He said, well, as a believer, you got privileges. Amen. Amen. I said, yeah? yeah sure he said, yeah, you got privileges. I said, okay. And he said, and guess what? Those privileges far outseed the privileges of being black or white. Amen. Oh, 
talk about it. Amen. Yeah, amen. So we've been in that series for what five, six, six weeks next today. Amen. Of the believer's privilege. Amen. And just gonna give you a snippet before I get into what my message is today. But we've been in. Uh, we've talked about the privilege of prayer. Yeah. How many people know that prayer was a privilege? It's a privilege that we don't even take advantage of like we should. Let me tell you how how prayer is a privilege. You and I as believers have the privilege of entering in the presence of God. You understand that? You are going into the presence of the creator of all that exists. You have the privilege of coming before him, not being destroyed, his grace being poured out on you, and you can make your request known to him. That's a privilege. And then on top of that, he said he's going to give you an answer. Amen. Now, it might not be the answer you want. But you want to get an answer. That's a privilege. A privilege that we need to, I hope after today, y'all start taking advantage of the privilege of prayer. You can go to God. Instead of trying to fix the problem on your own, you can go to the one who can really fix the problem the right way. Amen. Amen. So we've been in, we talked about the privilege of prayer. Um, what else did we talk about? We talked about, uh, let me find out where I am. And then we talked about the privilege of choice. Anybody remember that? Y'all remember that message? How many know that as believers you have a choice? You don't have to do anything that is outside the will of God for your life. You just got to choose it. We don't realize that I don't have to uh, 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 subscribe to what the world says. I don't have to subscribe to even what people in the ways of the church do. I don't have to. I don't have to pick a side. I don't have to be Republican. I have to touch somebody's foot right now to be in politic, political season. I don't have to be Republican. I don't have to be Democrat. I have a choice. I can choose who is who God inspires me to choose, and, and be fine with that. I don't, it, uh, we came from a scripture in Joshua where he said, choose this day who you will serve. He said to them, you can choose to serve the gods of the land that you're in, or you can choose to serve the gods of your fathers. But he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the true, the true and living God. Those are the choices that we have. You can choose to serve the gods in the land if you want to. I choose that I'm not going to do that. You can choose to serve the God of your family. Bad health, diseases, cancer, all that stuff. You can choose that if you want to. You can choose alcoholism, drugs. God gives you the option. If you want to choose that, guess what? It's right there before you. But then Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So you have the choice. We just got to take that choice. You know, even when temptation comes, you have a choice. God said, I will make a way of escape. But we just give into it. You don't have to do anything. He had, Jesus came to make you free. So that you're not bound to anything. We just don't choose freedom. So we, 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 we talked about the privilege of choice. I'm going to tell you today that you have the privilege of choice. You don't have to be anything that you don't really want to be. You don't have to act like nobody. You don't have to follow the crowd. You can be who God ordained you and made you to be from the, from the foundation of the earth. You just got to choose it. Amen? Amen? I'm telling you, choice will make you free. Yeah. You got to realize that you are free. Yeah. You don't have to be bound to anything unless you want to be. Right, right, yeah. You don't have to be bound to depression. Right, right. You don't have to be bound to the thoughts that's in your head. Yeah. Unless you want to keep choosing them. Right. So we, pre we preach on the privilege of choice. Amen. He preached on the privilege of promise. Amen. Do you know that as believers, we have the privilege of being recipients of the promises of God? Amen. The promises of God are all throughout His Word. It's a privilege to be recipients of the promises of God. Just, just go through God's Word and find out what His promises are to you. Find out what they are. You are a recipient, if you are a believer, yes. of those promises. Yes. Amen? Amen? So that's one thing we talked about 
Um, real quick, last week we talked about forgiveness. How many know that forgiveness is a privilege? It's a privilege that we receive. This is the part that we don't like, though. It's a privilege that we get to give. It's a privilege that we receive, and it's a privilege that we give. Amen? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if you want to be forgiven, you got to forget. Amen. Some of us here today, today got some people that we need to forgive. Do you know that there's an analogy that says being in unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die from it. You drink the poison and you expect them to die from it. That's stupid, right? Because you know if you drink it, you're the one going to die. Well, that's the same thing unforgiveness is. It's working against you. Some people are sick from unforgiveness. Some people are sick from not receiving forgiveness from God. Sick from guilt. It's true. Some people are sick from holding things against people, having unforgiveness in their hearts. But forgiveness is a privilege. You can receive it as a believer in Jesus Christ, and then you have to give it. And guess what? God will help you forgive people. If you ask him, and you're willing to do what, he, what he's telling you to do, it, it ain't going to feel good. First and foremost, we get stuck on feelings, but we got to get past that as believers too. That we don't walk by how we feel. But God will help you forgive people. Just say, Lord, I, I, I want to do what you want me to do. I have to say that all the time. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. Help me to do it. And then surrender and just do what he's telling you to do. So, forgiveness is a privilege. If you want to receive the forgiveness of God, you have to give the forgiveness of God. It's a privilege. It is a privilege. Amen? Amen. And if you don't know what a privilege is, a privilege is something that works in your favor. It works in your favor. It benefits you. Amen? And, and, and I'm sure you would agree, there's no use in having a privilege if you're not going to use it. Amen? Amen? So I've been admonishing all the those who are members of the Household of Faith Church and those who have tuned in through Facebook to take, a, take advantage of these privileges that we've been going over. Amen? Amen. Well, today, as I said, today is a, a, a day to give thanks. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about, just for a few minutes, the privilege of being thankful. Being thankful is a privilege. Again, like all the privileges I talked about before, we don't take advantage of it. We, we, we have a sense of entitlement. But, but what thankfulness does is, is cause you to realize that what you have, you really don't deserve it. There are people in the world who are better than you. There are people in the world who have worked harder than you and still don't have what you have. But being thankful gives you gratitude to God because you don't have to have anything that you have and you don't. Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about today. The privilege of being thankful. Real quick, we're going to come from the Gospel of Luke. I don't know if anybody has a Bible, you probably don't. If not, I'll read the scriptures, amen. <laughs> We're going to come from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 17, verse 15 through 16. Amen. And it says, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. From the time you are tiny children. Our parents are constantly reminding us to have good manners. How many, how many parents out here always telling your children to have good manners? We always tell Anaya that too much yet. She hates me like you in a sermon, but look at her face. <laughs> but, but when you ask for something, what do your parents tell you to say? Please. When you ask for something, your parents tell you to say, May I have this, please? May I have that, please? Also, when you receive something, what do your parents tell you to say? Thank you. Thank you. When you get something, it is of good manners to say thank you to the person that gave you something. Yes. Amen? Amen? Some of y'all are teaching that to your children now, as I say. Amen? Amen. Now, now, when our parents 
are reminding us to say please and thank you, they are helping us to understand thankfulness, what it means to be thankful. Let's say that you receive the gift that you really want. Everybody here like gifts, right? Amen. Let's say you receive the gift that you really like, that you really wanted. You are very happy, most likely you are very happy that you got that gift, right? But happy is not, being happy is not being thankful. Being thankful takes it a step further. When you are thankful for somebody giving you a gift, you think about what they did to get that gift to you. That they had to go shopping for it. They had to go out of their way to, to search for something that you liked. They had to pay for it out of their hard-earned money that they worked for. They might have got it wrapped for you, or they might have wrapped it themselves. And then they bought it to you. So, so when you think about all that they went through to get that gift to you, you are thankful. Because again, they didn't really have to do all of that, right? So, so, so out of your thankfulness, you may say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to them over and over, or you may even write them a thank you note because of you are because you are thankful. But that's what we're going to look at today in Luke 17. I read it for you in your hearing. In Luke 17, Jesus gave a gift to ten men, an amazing gift to ten men. And 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 while all ten of those men were happy. Only one of them showed thankfulness. Only one out of the ten. All of them received the gift from Jesus, but only one turned back and said thank you. Let's finish reading in Luke 17. At verse 11 it says, On the way to Jerusalem he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. And as they were cleansed, and as they went, they were cleansed. I'm going to stop at verse 14 real quick, because I want to just lay the ground for what's actually taking place here. You want to understand what's taking place here. Why it was such a big deal that Jesus healed these ten men. Now, now in all of our lives, bad things happen. Right? I'm sure everybody here has something uh, that you would consider to be bad happen to you, right? Sometimes, we don't like to admit it, sometimes these bad things that happen are consequences for bad choices. Sometimes these bad things that happen are consequences for bad decisions. Other times, these bad things that happen happen simply because we live in a sinful world. It's just the way it is. Things that we partake of or things that happen to us happen because we make bad choices and then other times, things happen just because they happen. Amen? We, we don't deserve everything that happens to us in this world. We don't. Sometimes things just happen because we are in a sinful world. Now, these men that we read about in Luke 17, they were called lepers, which means they had a, a skin disease called leprosy. The story doesn't say that they deserved leprosy. It just says that they had leprosy. Why did they have leprosy? Because they lived in a sinful world. Amen? And they were exposed to leprosy. It was a disease that they suffered from because we live in a sinful and fallen world. Amen? When God created the world, I'm sure you heard this over and over again or before, when God created the world, the world was perfect. Amen? There was no sickness. There was no death. Everything was beautiful. That's when God created the world. Everything was happy. Everything was good. But sin... I know we don't talk about sin too much these days. Now, we want to be a, rele a relevant church, but we still the church. Amen? So we talk about sin here, because that's the only way that people can get delivered. When we talk about what sin really is and what sin really does. Amen? So, so when sin came into the world, sin messed everything up. We're not going to talk about Adam and Eve, but we're going to talk about sin. Sin messed everything up. Now, because of sin, 
we got accidents, we got cancer, we got divorce, we got tornadoes, we got tsunamis, we got COVID because of sin. Amen? We got corona because of sin. Looking at all of these things, you can see how bad sin messed things up. So because we live in a fallen, sinful world, we have diseases as well. Leprosy was one of those diseases. In case you're wondering what leprosy really is, let me tell you. Leprosy is a terrible condition where a person's, skins begin, a person's skin begins to rot. It begins to rot to the point where it falls off. Amen? A person, as I said, who has this disease is called a leper. Amen? Many lepers, people who are lepers, they lose their fingers. They lose their toes because of this disease. Just to give you a picture of how bad it was and what these men were dealing with. You can tell if a person was a leper because they would have sores all over their body. In the Bible times, leprosy was a common disease. We don't hear about it too much today. But back then, it was common. It, it, it still exists today in parts of the world like India, China, Japan, South Africa, those parts of the world. But back then, it was common. Now, leprosy was very contagious. It was easy to catch leprosy. If you even just touched the person who was a leper, you could get the disease. If you even just touched something that belonged to them, a t-shirt, some clothing, you can get leprosy. So, so whenever a person caught leprosy in the Bible times, they had to live outside of their community. They couldn't be around anybody because that's how contagious the disease was. In fact, God gave a law to the Israelites in the Old Testament just to show you how contag contagious this disease was. In Leviticus 13, 45 and 46, it says this. It says, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip. That sounds like today you got to wear a mask. Yeah. Amen? Look at that Samantha with a mask. <laughs> so they had to wear a mask. They had to cry out, unclean. Unclean. And then it says this. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So when a person was a leper, they couldn't even be around anybody. As I said, it sounds like today, but that's social distancing and, and word masses. If, McKinsey, mind if I use you as an example? I ain't gonna use it now. If McKinsey had leprosy, she couldn't be here with us today. She would probably even have to leave the city. This, this is how they dealt with lepers. She couldn't be here. She would have to leave the city. She had to live outside the city by herself. That's sad, right? That's crazy sad. But that's how they dealt with it. So you can see that, that leprosy wasn't just bad for the person who had it. It was bad for their family, for their children if they had them, because nobody could be around them. Amen? So because lepers, oh God, person is okay. Because lepers had to live alone, they would seek out other lepers to spend time with. That was the only way they could have companionship, because they couldn't be around anybody who didn't have it. So the only safe place to be was around somebody who had leprosy. Well, this is why those 10 men were together. There's a little background. Those ten men were together because that was the only way they could find companionship. Amen? Amen. Leprosy made a person unclean. So because it was so contagious, the people who had it had to cry out, unclean, unclean. Wherever they were, if they were walking on the road, they had to scream out, unclean. If they were any, in any proximity of the people or of other people, they had to scream out, unclean. Imagine you having to scream out, Everything that was wrong with you every time you got around a person. That's what these people had to do. Now, the religious leaders of the day, those who like to add to the rules that God already gave, 
They told these lepers that they couldn't even go into the temple like everybody else. They, they, it wasn't because they were afraid of the lepers spreading the disease. They did it because they also felt it. Not only were they unclean as far as the disease is concerned, but to them they were unclean spiritually. They, they thought that their heart was dirty. This is what the leaders of that day did to them. So not only did they have a terrible disease, they were also accused of having unclean hearts. Imagine that. Imagine that. Wouldn't it be terrible if somebody accused you of being a bad person just because you were sick? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, isn't it bad if somebody accused you of, of being unclean because you had a call for a sneeze? What if you had strep throat and somebody said you can't go into the church? This is what they did to these people. What if getting sick meant that you can never see your family again, your children, your mother, your father? This is what these people, these lepers, had to go through. What if somebody told you that God didn't want anything to do with you because you were sick? That would be terribly unfair, wouldn't it? But that is what these people had to go through. That's why these men, as we read, these men in the story, when they saw Jesus and they stood at a distance calling to him because they felt they couldn't go near anybody. They felt like he didn't want anything to do with them. So they stayed away and called to him from a distance. They believed that they were bad people. And they believed that they were unacceptable to God. I just want to pause right here to tell anybody right here Anybody who's here, if you feel like in any way, shape, or form that you are unacceptable to God, that is a lie. God is not intimidated by anything that you may have going on in your life. And the fact of the matter is, God is the only one that can really do anything about it. All I'm saying is don't let what you've heard from somebody who really did not know God themselves, keep you from going to God. Yes. Amen? Yes. He wants you. He loves you. Yes. With everything that's wrong with you. Yes. And he wants you to get it right. Yes. Amen? Amen? Jesus told these people when they called out to him, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. After they said to him, Jesus, have mercy on us, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. That's an awkward conversation. They called out. He said, go. He didn't say anything like you're healed or anything like that. But as the story goes, it says, as they went, they noticed that they were healed. That's the power of God. You don't have to do anything. He'll do everything. That's a word for somebody here who feels like you got to get yourself cleaned up. Who feels like you got to get yourself straightened up. Who feels like you got to do all of this list before you come to God. You don't have to do anything. All you got to do, really, like these lepers said, is Jesus have mercy on me, he will cleanse you. Amen. Everything. Anybody watching, that's all you got to do. I, I am a living testimony of it. Amen? So it says, as they went, they noticed that they were cleansed, that they had been healed. Their skin changed from, from being full of sores and rot and falling off to being brand new, even so much as a brand new baby's skin. That, that's, that's, that's the real significance of the story. Their skin went from being rotten and falling off to having skin as smooth and as soft and as clear as a brand new baby's skin. That's the power of God. Yes. So let's continue reading real quick in Luke 17, 15 to 19, and let's see what happened. I'll be out your way. 15, it says, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. That's a whole other story. Because the Samaritans and the Jews didn't have any dealings with one another. Jesus was a Jew. That's a whole other story right there, too. I know many of us think that Jesus was Caucasian. 
And there are people who say that Jesus was, is African American. No, Jesus is Jewish. Amen. Our Savior is Jewish, but Jewish. But it doesn't even matter what his ethnicity is. The scriptures say that God took from the Jewish and the Gentiles and made one new people. I'm of that new people. Amen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're of that new people. Amen. So, so it says that um, they noticed that they were healed and one came back to Jesus to say thank you. Now he was a Samaritan. A Samaritan came to say thank you to the Jew who they had nothing to do with. And then Jesus said to him, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? When no one was found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Isn't it crazy that only one man out of the ten came back to say thank you? Now, now when, I, when I read the scripture, I get, a, I get a picture of it. So, so most likely, just giving these other nine men the benefit of the doubt, when they realized that they were healed, they probably got excited. You know, like we do. They probably got excited and they said, man, I can go home now. I ain't seen my wife, my kids in a long time. Let me go back home and show them that I'm cleansed. I can be around you now. I can touch you. I can hug you. So, so most likely, that's probably what they did. But they didn't go back and say thank you to the one who did it. This one, though, who realized that his skin had changed, said, I want to go home to my family, but let me just hold off for a minute. Let me go back and say thank you to the one who actually did it. Let me go back and say thank you to the one who actually did it. Now, now these other nine men, do, do you see yourself in them in any shape, any shape, fashion, or form? They received the blessing of God, right? And they hadn't been around their family, so it was understandable that they would want to show off. But do you see yourself in them? You want to show off the blessings that God gives you. You want to, you want to show them off, you know, because God did bless you with them. But, but, but do you want to show them off before you say thank you to Him? Do you run to your family? Do you run to Facebook, do you run to the IG and post them before you bow down and raise your hands and, and worship God and say thank you, do you? I'm not going to necessarily say that you're wrong in doing it. I just want to bring it to your mind, first and foremost, for you to stop and say thank you to God. Because in reality, everything that you have right now came from Him. And this, and this is how good God is. Even if you don't believe him, he still has blessed you yes. with everything that you have. Everything that you have. Yes. I'm just trying to admonish you to just stop and say thank you. When Jesus gave his life for us, his blood cleansed us from a disease that was way more hideous than leprosy. The disease of sin. Remember when I mentioned how sin messed everything up? Well, we are also a part of what sin messed up. Amen? We are also a part of what sin messes up. Like a terrible disease, sin ruins us. It ruins us. Sin is a great spiritual need that requires healing. But guess what? Jesus can heal it just like he healed leprosy. Just got to cry out. The thing is, we, if, if we're sick physically, we recognize that far more uh, often than we recognize spiritual sickness. When we're hungry, we eat. Right? When, when we're tired, what we do? We go lay down. But when we're sinning our lives, we don't deal with that. We don't deal with that. But I'm not one of those preachers that give you a long list of how you deal with it. I'm just going to tell you straight forward. Go to God. Go to God. Ask Him to forgive you. And the Bible says that when you ask, He does it immediately. He said if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you 
from all unrighteousness. So it's not even a process. It happens in a moment. Now you might have to deal with whatever, whatever comes with that a little bit longer, but as it stands with God and receiving forgiveness, it's immediate. So we just got to deal with the sin that is in our lives. But, just, but sin, just like this leprosy, it causes rot in us. Rot of who God, who he called you and ordained you to be. Sin prevents you from your purpose. How many here want to leave this world without actually fulfilling what God put you here to do? Nobody, right? You want to you do what God put you here to do, right? The only way to do that is to get right with your creator. Ask him to forgive you and cleanse of your sin. And then ask him to help you to fulfill your purpose. It's just as simple as that. So when we cry out to God, he promises to heal us. Amen? And like the leper who returned throwing himself at Jesus' feet, we should turn around, come back to him, and scream with a loud voice and say thank you to Jesus. Amen? The ten lepers in Luke 17 were given a great gift. The problem was, none of them didn't turn around with true thankfulness and say thank you. Sure, they were happy they received the gift of healing, but they didn't choose to give thanks to the gift giver. When Jesus asked, weren't there ten healed? Where are the other nine? He was asking, why aren't they giving thanks to me for what I've done? That's, that's what he was saying. He was saying, why aren't they giving thanks to God for what he's done? Well, I just want to, since today is a, a day of thanks, I don't want you to be a listed among the people who Jesus says, why aren't these people giving me thanks? If all of you here look at your life, I am sure there are a multiplicity of things you can give God thanks for. Yes. Yes. Just stop and say thank you. Amen. Be appreciative of everything that you have. Even life today, there's so many people who have lost their lives through this thing called COVID, but God chose for it not to come near us. For that, we can say thank you. Amen. Everything might not be perfect in your life yes. or the way you want it to be, but you're alive, and you can say thank you to God because of that. Amen. You may have went through some difficult situations. I won't deny that. And God doesn't want you to deny it, but you're still here. Yeah. For that, you can say yes. thank you. Jesus gave us, we talked about forgiveness earlier, Jesus gave us the unbelievable free gift of forgiveness. As I said, you ain't got to do nothing to get it. Even though our sin deserves to be punished, he took the punishment on himself. Amen? When he died on the cross, what bigger gift could he give you? What more could you want? Really, really, if he doesn't do anything else for you. I know you heard that before, but it's a fact, it's true. If he paid for my sin, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll happily go do everything else. Amen? Amen? But the problem is, many of us haven't stopped to say thank you. That's all I'm trying to impress upon you today, to be thankful. To say thank you for God, for, for not what he's going to do, for not your prayer of this, but for what he's done already. You are blessed. We are blessed. We don't take the time to recognize how truly blessed we are. You don't stop to say thank you. As I say, God has kept us in this pandemic. Shay talked about her job. Some of us here still have our job. That's a blessing. You know how many people lost their jobs? I've been working like nothing ever happened. I'm thankful to God for that. Have, have y'all stopped to say, anybody here who has your employment still stop to say thank you, God? We got our right mind. You might be a little bit crazy, but you're not totally crazy. That's by the grace of God. Have you stopped to say, God, I thank you for my little bit of right mind? You're in good health. Yes. You might not be in completely good health. Yes. You might be limping a little bit. Yes. But you got the ability to limp. Have you said thank you to God for that? Yes. 
it's a blessing. Do you know that there's somebody who would like to win? There's somebody in the wheelchair who doesn't have use of their legs that would push I could just win. You don't look at stuff like that and say it's a blessing. But you are blessed. Amen. Amen. All I'm saying is that you stop and thank God for everything that you have. This is a day to be thankful. So the message from God is clear. We should have a heart filled to overflowing with thankfulness to God. And not just to God. As I say to other people because you haven't arrived where you are by yourself. There's a lot of people who have done things for you. Have you stopped to say thank you to them? You should say thank you to the people. We have done things for you. As I said, I thank everybody who's here and all those who have given the house to the faith church and those who support you. Because I realize that I'm not no special person. And I haven't done all of this by myself. Amen? My wife, my daughter, and the faithful members of the house of the faith church did all of this. Amen? So we got to stop and say thank you, not just to God, but thank you to other people as well. Amen? So God has done so much for us. He deserves, amen, he deserves our thanks. So here's what Psalm 107, 1 and 2 says about thankfulness real quick. It says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. How many here have been redeemed from trouble? <laughs> and you should be saying thank you to the Lord. Amen. Jesus was publicly crucified to heal our sins. We should be able, I know we want to praise God behind closed doors, I can praise God by myself, but God wants a public praise as well. Amen? We should be able to publicly praise God and thank Him for the amazing gifts that He gives to us. Amen? We should live a life of thankfulness. Just like the leper who returned to say thank you to Jesus, we should return to God and say thank you to Him. Amen? And Colossians 2 and 7 says that we should be abounding in thankfulness. Meaning that you should be overflowing. You should be so thankful that you're beside yourself. Yeah. Now, I got to keep reiterating, but the fact of the matter is, we got so much to be thank you, thankful for. You should be able to go through your house and say, God, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Look at your children. Look at yourself and say, thank you for that. We got so much to be thankful for. Amen. So I'm going to close real quick. Because as I said, it's a, we're talking about the privilege of thankfulness. Yeah. And privilege is something that I said that works for your benefit. So I'm going to share real quick five things that thankfulness does for you. One, thankfulness glorifies God. Thankfulness gives God the glory that is due his name. That is reason, reason alone by itself to be thankful. This is what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 4.15 says, As God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. Thankfulness helps us to realize that all we have does not come because of us, but because, but because of God. So when, we, so when we're truly thankful, we will give God the glory that he deserves because we didn't really do what we thought we did to get what we had. Amen? Amen? Number two, thankfulness helps us see God. Yes. What I mean by that? Thankfulness opens your eyes spiritually. There's a beautiful cycle in giving thanks. The more and more you thank God, the more you'll see and recognize the things that he's done for you. The more you thank God, the more you'll see him working in you and working for you and working through you. When you're ungrateful, you feel like God hasn't done anything for you. But the more thankful that you are, you open your eyes and say, man, God, you did this. God, you did that. God, you did this. God, you did that. And, that. and the more you're thankful, the more you recognize what God has done. James 1 and 16, James 1, 16 and 17 says this. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every gift that you consider good, guess where it came from? God. You might have thought you did whatever you think you did to get it, but it ultimately came from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. You should be thankful. Amen? 
Number three, thankfulness puts a smack dead in the middle of God's will. As I talked about earlier, God's will is the safest place in the whole wide world, right? Yeah. Thankfulness puts you smack in the middle of his will. Thankfulness puts you smack in the middle of his will. When you think about the will of God, you're probably thinking about some big mystical thing in church terms. God's will is some big mystical plan. But, but sometimes God's will is just doing what he says. That's it. God's will is doing what he says. And you want to know what, God's will, what, God, what the word says God's will is? It says this. Give thanks in every circumstance. So this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. God's will is for you to be thankful in, not for, but in every circumstance. Why does it say in and not for? Because every circumstance really doesn't come from God. We talked about it earlier. Some things just happen. So when we say, why did God allow this and why did God allow that? God do have, does have the power to stop it, but he gives us free will. And we don't want to talk about free will. We want to say, why did God allow this person to get killed? What if God spoke to that person hard and said, don't kill him? But if you choose to do it, God spoke to you and said, don't lay down with this person. But if you choose to do it, he gave you free will. So that's why things happen, because we don't always choose to obey what God says. If we did choose to obey what God says, we wouldn't have half the things going on in the world that we have going on. That's outside of my word, let me get back in. <laughs> But God's will is that we give thanks in everything. Not for everything, but in everything. Why in everything? Because it could be worse. It could be worse. So I thank you, God, that while I'm in this unpleasant situation, I realize that it could be worse. So I give you thanks in it. Amen? His will is for us to be thankful in every situation. Verse number four. Thankfulness brings contentment. When you're thankful, you're content. When you're thankful, you're content. Many of us here need to be content. Because we got too much as it is. Thankfulness brings contentment. It is said that thankfulness makes what we have enough. When you're thankful and you see all that you have, you say, man, I got more than enough. If you are unthankful for what God has already given us, guess what? Getting more ain't going to satisfy you. Because you're going to want more and more and more. But when you're thankful, you'll realize, I mean, it's okay to get other, to get more and more things if you want. Them. If you got the money, I say, hey, go get it. But if you're not thankful, you're never going to be satisfied with, with getting more and more things. Being thankful brings Contentment. This is what 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8 says. It says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can't carry anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. That's all you need, really. If you look at life, all you need is food and clothing. Everything else is a blessing. Everything else. You got to be thankful. Gotta be thankful. Last one, number five. Thankfulness guards against envy. Let me say that again. Thankfulness guards against envy. Envy makes us want what somebody else has. Envy will, make, will even make you think that you have a right to it. And you don't even know what that person did, sacrificed to get it. But envy makes you feel like you have a right to what they have. Yes. But if you're thankful, you won't be envious. Yes. Thankfulness makes us realize that God has given us far more than we even deserve already. Amen? And because we are thankful, we also realize that there's enough for everybody. I don't have to have or want what somebody else has. I can go and get my own. Thankfulness makes you realize that you ain't got to compete, but you can compliment. Some people need to compliment people today. Most, a lot of people are hating on what people have. You ain't got to hate on what nobody has. 
You can go get your own. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to compete. You can compliment. Yeah. When, when, you're, when, you're, when you're thankful, you don't have to compare. You don't have to compare. You can cheer other people on when you're thankful. Amen. Yeah. A heart filled with thankfulness has no room left for envy. When you're thankful, there's no envy in your heart. That has no room for it. Psalm 138 says this, I will give you thanks with all of my heart. My intent for this message was to cause everybody here just to look back yeah. over your life, even yesterday, and just to see the goodness of God. Amen. Just to see how gracious God has been yeah. to all of us. If, if we look back and just see how good and gracious God has been, we will be thankful. Yeah. We should be thankful. Amen? Amen? That along with the hopes that as you see how good God is, how good God still is to you, that if you haven't ever turned to him in your life, that you will choose to this day. I showed you and I told you how easy it is. I'm not one of those people that's going to make it a hard thing. I showed you and I told you what you got to do to get received, to receive forgiveness from God. And my intent was to show you how good he's been to you so that you would do that. This is what the scripture says about God's goodness. Romans 2 and 4. It says God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. That's the whole reason why God is good to you. The whole reason why God is good to you is because he wants you to see how good he is and then turn to him. You know that a lot of people in this world suffer bad things and then they turn to God. You know God really doesn't want that to happen? You don't want nothing, no crazy bad thing to happen to you and then you say, oh, let me give my life to God. He don't want that to happen. He wants you to see how good he is. And then turn to him. But the bad things happen because we refuse to turn. I just want to tell you, I want to show you how good God has been to you. That everything that you have, you being here today, is a result of the goodness of God. And he's been so good to you because he wants you to come to him. That's it. His goodness is so that you will come to him. His goodness is so that you will repent. Repent only means remorse. Be remorseful. God wants you to be remorseful of anything and everything that you've done outside of him. That's it. He wants you to be remorseful, and he wants you to turn to him. So, I'm done. But here at House of the Faith Church, we don't put anybody on the spot. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in putting anybody on the spot. But if you, you're here, and you've been made aware of how good God has been to you, you can receive him right where you are. Right where you ain't got to raise your hand, you ain't got to say that's me or none of that kind of stuff. God knows. Amen? So, so right where you are, if you want to receive God because you've been made aware of his goodness, as I told you, that's all he wants you to do is see how good he's been to you and then turn to him. So if anybody here has been made aware of how good God is, just pray this prayer with me. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I hate doing this because I feel like if anybody wants to come to God, you can talk to him for yourself. But I'll just guide you along the way. Amen? So you can pray something like this or something similar to this. Father God, I realize just how good you've been to me. Just how gracious you've been to me. And I am thankful. In your goodness, you sent Jesus, your son, to die for my sins. He died for my sins and he rose for my salvation. For that, I am thankful. As a result of my thankfulness, I repent of my sins and I turn to you. I ask you to come into my heart, save me, fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live this day on for you in Jesus' name. It's just that simple. If you prayed that prayer along with you or something like that, guess what? I believe, we believe in the household of faith church that you are saved. Yeah. Romans 10, Roman 10 and 9 says this. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord right. and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, yeah. you will be saved. Yeah. 
for it's with your heart that it, that you for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if you did that, the scripture told you that you are saved. Now, all you have to do or what you should do is want to learn more about God and what his will is for your life. If you want to, you can do that here at Household of Faith Church. If not, God bless you. But you should learn more about God, who God is, and what he wants to do for you. Amen? At Household of Faith Church, there's a plug. We are imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And we do it together. I believe that we don't have to walk this walk alone. God has called us to walk along the other side, other, alongside other people who have the same mind, who have the same heart, who are willing to serve God and help each other. That's, that's what we strive to be at Household of Faith Church. So in closing, let me sit on down. Hope that you received the word of God today, and I just want to encourage you. But if anybody wants to take uh, my offer, you can see me as a Tina. Amen. God bless y'all and be thankful. Amen.